Hey everyone, thanks so much for tuning in today. Uh, my name is Neil and we're going to be talking about shell balances. And shell balances are really fundamental to understanding a lot of the systems that you're going to be dealing with when it comes um, when it comes to transport. Now, there's two different types of systems in general that you'll be analyzing. One is macro systems and the other is micro systems. Macro systems you'll be using integral balances, micro systems you'll be using derivative balances. Now you ask yourself, well, how do I know which one to use? Well, let's take a look at some examples that fall into each. So, um, in macro, you're generally going to be dealing with system-wide system -wide properties. Okay? So, for example, um, let's say we have a pipe that we're looking at, and you want to figure out something about that pipe. Now, this has to deal with system-wide properties because this system is this entire pipe and it's going to be dealing with momentum in, momentum out, there's going to be forces acting in different directions, it's not uniform. Okay. Um, another example would be, let's say, average velocity um, in a pipe. Okay. This is a system-wide property, it has to do with um, properties throughout the system. Okay. Now let's take a look at some requirements for a system to be micro. Micro, what you're going to be doing is shrinking a system down to a point, okay? Now in order to shrink a system down to a point, there's a couple requirements that have to be met. Let's take a look at some of them. Let's get a different color pen. Okay, so requirements. Um, when you start working in transport, um, the first problems you're going to be dealing with generally have to do with fluid. So, you're going to be looking at laminar flow. Laminar flow simply means that the flow is consistent throughout, it's not turbulent, um, it's easy to model. Additionally, you don't want to have any bends in your system. The fluid flow has to be in one direction. Um, whether that direction is a uh, straight line in Cartesian coordinates or uh, in a circle when you're dealing with cylindrical or spherical coordinates. Additionally, and this one's really important, it has to be steady state. Okay? Come on, Dan. There we go. It has to be steady state. If you want to use a shell balance. Okay? You're going to be dealing with some microsystems that are not steady state, but if that's the case, then the shell balance does not apply. We'll take a look at that um, a little bit later. And, and two, you have to be able to define at least two boundary conditions. If you have these requirements, then you're good to go for using the shell balance. And what we're going to be taking a look at is how do we reduce, reduce a system to an infinitesimal point. You're going to be dealing with several different types of coordinate systems in transport. The most typical that you're going to be seeing is a Cartesian coordinate system. This is your typical x, y, z. All right? And you'll also have cylindrical coordinate systems. You have a z direction. You have an r direction and you also have a theta direction, okay? Let me go back here and just put in the axes for sake of continuity. Z, X, and Y, okay? And at times, you'll also encounter cylindrical coordinate systems, and these are a little bit more tricky to to work with when it comes to using the shell balance. There's going to be more terms in the equation and it just gets a little bit messy, but that's not to say that you won't see it. Just It's not as likely. So for this, this coordinate system, you're going to be working with an R, A, A 
phi and a theta. Okay? So what did I just draw here? It looks like a bunch of boxes, but these are going to be the building blocks for the shell balance. So here, what is this? Basically, this is an infinitesimally small cube. And this is going to be the building block for how we derive the shell balance. If you look back at one of our conditions, we said it's going to be steady state. So how does this apply to this cube that we just drew? Well, if it's steady state, then what's inside of this cube is not going to be changing with time. If it's in one state at t equals zero, then five minutes later it's going to be the same. If you think back to your BME 200 days, um, back in basic conservation principles, you'll remember that accumulation equals in minus out plus the sum of the forces. Okay? For the sake of this podcast, since we're dealing with the shell balance, we know that accumulation is going to be zero because the system is at steady state. Now, if it's a steady state, then what you have going in must, equals, must equal what's coming out. So we could just cancel these to zero, but we're going to leave these in for the, for the meantime. And we'll explain what we do with them a little bit later. Now, the sum of forces. What forces are we dealing with? What forces can we deal with? We have three. Most obvious from physics, we got gravity. We also have shear and pressure. Okay. There we go. Squeeze that in right there. This entire equation, although there's accumulation in minus out, what we're actually doing is balancing forces. And the first problems that you'll deal with in transport have to do with balancing momentum. Okay, momentum is simply, if you remember, momentum is mass times velocity. An accumulation of mass on one side, mass coming into the system at a certain velocity, so momentum entering the system at a certain rate. We have momentum leaving the system at a certain rate, and we also have forces from gravity, shear, and pressure. Now, you say, okay, I recognize gravity, I recognize pressure, but what is shear? Let's take a look at shear forces and just clear up some of the conventions that uh, will become handy when you're working with shear in the future. So the symbol for shear is tau and when we're working with shear there's going to be two subscripts that we always put next to it. The first one is going to, is going to indicate the plane that the shear force is acting in and the second one is going to indicate the direction it's acting in. Okay? So let's give you a little example of how one would typically um, assign those two subscripts. So here is our unit volume. You're going to become really used to drawing this figure. Let's imagine that we have a shear force acting and the top in this direction. We're going to establish our coordinate system z, x, and y. Okay? So let's look at this shear force right here. What plane is it acting in? Well, it's acting on the top plane. The top plane is in the z direction, it goes up and down, so it's going to be a tau z 
and the direction it's acting in is in the x direction, so it's going to be a tau z x. We have a shear acting in the x direction, and whenever you have a shear acting in one direction, there's also going to be one acting in the opposite direction. So there's going to be a tau z x acting at the bottom as well. Let's say we had, for the sake of argument, one acting on this face, except that this time it's going backwards. Let's see. What plane is this? What plane is it in? It's in the X plane. And what direction is it acting in? It's acting in the Y direction. It doesn't matter if it's going in the negative Y direction. Those sign conventions will be figured out um, when you're doing the actual shell balance. Okay. So what is the big long equation that you're going to be writing a million times over and over again on homework? Let's try it out really quick and then we'll go into an explanation of what each one of the terms means. Okay, so on this side, what we have is a, this is a rho, the density, times a velocity vector integrated over volume. All in all, that comes down to a momentum times the volume, the volume of the box that we're working with, divided by time, which reduces to a force. Okay? We have force on one side, therefore all of the terms on the other side must also be forces. On these next two terms, this is your n term. So this is a flow of momentum into the system. This is flow of momentum out of the system. This will come from fluid moving through that imaginary box that we made. Okay, so we have a velocity vector, um, density, also times again by velocity, and integrated over an area. What do we have here? We have a momentum times a velocity times an area. And if you do the work and cancel out the units, you'll also get a force. Perfect. And the sum of forces. This is where all of your work is going to go. This is where your boundary conditions come in. This is where you have to analyze the system. For shell balances, this is always going to be zero because your system is steady state. There is no change in momentum with time. And we'll discuss why this goes, why the n minus out term goes to zero in a little bit. To understand how to apply this, I'm going to walk you through a couple of examples. So the first example we're going to look at has to do with this system where we have two glass slides. And in between these glass slides, we have this fluid that is flowing. And the fluid is going to have a little bit of tackiness. It's going to be sticking the top and bottom of these slides. So in between these two slides, there's a fluid that is going through a certain velocity, and we're going to say that this fluid does not have a constant velocity profile. It is, in fact, parabolic. We have to do a couple things. We want to define the velocity for that parabolic uh, velocity profile. And we are asked to determine the shear force for molecules going in between those two slides. So just to clarify the system a little bit, here's a profile. Up on top we have the slides. And here's a fluid moving through 
that slide. Our coordinate system is going to be an x. It's going to be our x equals zero plane. This is going to be our y. And there's the height of h. So let's ask ourselves a couple of questions. Where do we go from here? Well, first of all, our coordinate system is Cartesian, so we know to use a square box. And what's going to be our unit volume? Well, we're just going to transfer over the coordinates. This is going to be y. This is going to be z. And this is going to be x. So, a little particle of fluid moving through this profile. Let's say it's, it's right here. Actually, let's say it's up here. You, it's up there. It's up there. Okay. <laughs> what are the forces that are going to be acting on it? We have fluid moving, so there's a pressure gradient. Whenever you have fluid moving, there's going to be a pressure gradient. There's going to be pressure acting on it on one side. And pressure acting from the other direction. This is key to remember, pressure always acts on a system. So you're never going to have an arrow, this arrow on this side pushing the other way. The arrows are always going to be pointing in to the system. So we have a P1 and we have a P2. Alright, so we have pressure acting on this because there's fluid moving and you know we also have a shear force. The way that I like to define shear force is which way is our velocity moving. So if we say that this point is right there then our velocity is in this direction. So I try to imagine this little guy and the guys on top of him are going to be going slower. The guys on below him are going to be going faster. So the guys below him will be pulling him in this direction. And the guys on top of him, since they're going slower, they're going to be pulling him in that direction. So here is one shear force, and here's another shear force. Okay, now remember back to our subscripts. Let's see, this is a tau y. Because it's acting in the y plane, and it's working in the x direction. So tau y x, and this is also a tau y x. Do we have pressure, a shear force on the front or back? No. Do we have a shear force on the sides? No, only top and bottom. The problem did not state gravity was involved. We do not have to include a gravity force. If, however, the problem did state there was gravity, then we would have to include a y equals um, f equals mg. Oh, here's one more important thing when you're dealing with uh, the shell balance. Since we're dealing with microscopic, infinitely small volumes, infinitely small points, infinitely small points do not have mass. So rather than working with mass, we're going to be using uh, the comparable units of density times volume. Still give us units of mass, but allow us to shrink this box down to an infinitely small volume. Okay, so we did step one. We defined our system, and we defined our system, and we did we defined coordinates and the forces that are acting on our on our unit volume. So now let's do the shell balance. Accumulation equals in minus out plus the sum of forces. Now if we look back to our problem, is any fluid accumulating on this side? In this box? 
No, we're assuming that the velocity profile is constant and it's already been going for a while. Is anything accumulating in our system? No. Therefore, we can cancel it out. Is what going into the glass slides coming out of the glass slides? Yes, it is. So, our in minus out in total is going to go to zero. And when you're taking the test, you want to justify this. So, we're assuming that we're working with an incompressible fluid, and with an incompressible fluid, the velocity gradient is zero. Simple equation right now we have zero equals our sum of forces. We already defined our forces. Our first force that we defined was pressure. So we have a P1 and where is it acting? The P1 is acting right here. We'll call this X. We have P1 acting at X. Now, we want all of our terms on this side of the equation to be forces. So in order to make a pressure into a force, we have to multiply it by an area. If you remember, pressure equals force divided by area. So force is just pressure times area. And what's the area that it's, that it's acting on? It's acting on some delta Z and some delta Y. That's the area of that side of the bottom, delta Y, delta Z. Okay, now we also have another pressure acting in, and that's acting at X plus delta X on the same side. Opposite side, same area. What we did there was just to find this as x plus delta x because p2 is acting at this x coordinate. Okay, so we did pressure. Now, the one force we have left is shear. It's important for us to be consistent with our signs. We defined positive pressure to be in the direction of the velocity flow. So for shear, we want positive shear to be in the direction of velocity flow. What this means is that this shear force is helping this block move in this direction because our velocity is in this direction. Our velocity vector is in this direction. So our tau yx, our ta tau yx, at y is going to be positive. We define this as y and this is at y plus delta y. Let's look at our other shear force. We have another shear force at tau yx. This one's acting on the top side of the cube so at y plus delta y and it's negative because it's going, it's slowing it down. It's on the top side, it's slowing down the flow of the motion of that block. So this is the building block of the shell balance. If we go back to this side, we can see that this was a change in momentum over time times the volume. So to get rid of the delta y and delta z, oh yeah, I need to go back here and include a delta x, delta y. To get rid of these terms, we're going to divide each side by the volume of that cube. It's not actually a delta x, delta y, that we're multiplying the shear force by, uh, we're multiplying it by delta x delta z because that's the area of the bottom and top surface of this cube, delta x 
delta z. Excuse me for that. All right, so this leaves us with an equation with delta x's, delta y's, and delta z's. However, in order to reduce this equation to an infinitely small point, we have to take the derivative. And in order to get there, we're going to take this one little step, which involves dividing both sides by the volume of the box, dividing it by delta x, delta y, delta z. So let's go ahead and do that. That leaves us with a p1 at x minus a p at x plus delta x. divided by delta x because our delta y and delta z's cancel out when we divide this side by the volume. Likewise, if we do the same thing to the shear um, component of the equation, we're going to get a tau at y x, y minus tau y x, y plus delta y. You know what that little scribble sign means divided by what let's, what's left over, a delta y, because the delta x and the delta z cancel out. Okay, now if you go back to your calculus, calculus one or two days, you'll recognize that this is the definition of a derivative. Therefore, this can simplify down to the derivative of pressure with respect to x, and this is going to be negative because the typical definition counts for the x plus delta x component to be first and to subtract the x component from that. So since these two are switched, it's going to be negative. And likewise, if we do the same thing on this side, we're going to get a derivative of tau y x with respect to y. And once again, it's negative because um, our y plus delta x is being subtracted from our y term. Okay, this is the first part of the shell balance, shell balancing procedure. And what does this leave, leave us with? It leaves us with a dp dx equals d tau dy. Where do we go from here? In order to solve for the shear force, which is what we're going for, we need to do two more things. One, we need to apply Newton's law of viscosity, and we need to find two boundary conditions. We need to define two boundary conditions. What is Newton's law of viscosity? It's merely shear force equals the viscosity times the derivative of the velocity with respect to y. So if these components were switched, if it was a tau x y instead of tau y x, this would be dvy dx rather than dvx dy. Well, we can't really plug this part into here because our shear force is still in terms of a derivative. How do we solve that? Simple. We integrate. So let's integrate this side. In order to do that, we have to take this dy over to here. We multiply each side by dy. And we're just going to treat the dp dx as a constant. And let's integrate each one of these. This is going to leave us with some delta p, the delta x times y plus a constant equals tau y x. Beautiful. Now we can take this and plug it in for tau y x. Take this down. We still have a delta p delta x equals mu dv x d 
dy. Here we have everything that we need. Once we do one more integration, we're going to get one more constant of integration. When we take the dy over to this side and integrate, and we'll be left with an equation in terms of y and x and vx. So we can find a velocity in the x direction at any point along the y-axis, which is exactly what we wanted. Really quickly, I'm just going to go over boundary conditions in order to solve this integration. I'm not going to go, to I'm not going to go ahead and do the integration for you. I'll let you do that. Um, but I do want to talk about boundary conditions really quickly. This entire class of problems that we're dealing with right now have to do with momentum. And when it comes to momentum, there are two types of boundary conditions that you're going to find. You're going to find velocity boundary conditions, and you're also going to find shear boundary conditions. Your velocity boundary condition is going to be either velocity equals a constant or velocity equals zero. Most of the time it's going to be velocity equals zero. Now where do we find velocity equals zero? If we have fluid flow inside of a pipe, then along the walls of that pipe, the velocity at a wall is going to be zero. And this comes from the, the assumption that there is no slip, no slip at the wall, in which case that boundary condition must be zero. Now, our other boundary condition is a no shear boundary condition that our change in shear is zero. Now this is going to occur at a symmetry plane. If we apply this to this problem that we're dealing with right now, where do we have, where do we find a symmetry plane? You're right. Right there. At this plane, the velocity profile above it and below it is going to be exactly equal. That is why we define the x-axis to be coming straight through the middle here. This makes it a lot easier when we come in and do our boundary conditions to say to say that at not not at x equals zero at y equals zero dt dy equals zero. This is our first boundary condition. What's our other boundary condition? Well, if we go back to the problem, we can see that we have a wall right here. We're going to assume that there's no slip at this wall, therefore the velocity at this point is going to equal zero. So, at y equals h over 2, v equals 0. Pretty simple. We can go back in, plug these terms into our integration, and solve for c1 and c2. Let's look at one more example. For this example, we're dealing with a capillary tube. Now, you want to dip this capillary tube into this medium plastic material. Think, think kind of like honey, okay? And you're going to dip this in into the liquid, and the liquid is going to come up inside of here, and it's going to coat the inside of the capillary wall. 
our goal is to determine how thick this coat is going to be. All right, so step one of working with the system is we need to define our coordinates. We need to define exactly what our system is. Okay, let's do a cross profile of the capillary tube. We're gonna blow it up just for the sake of visualization. And this is our symmetry plane. This is the axis of the capillary tube. This right here, this is our plasticky material. And this is the wall of the capillary tube, the walls on each side. What's our coordinates? Coordinate system. We'll define this as the z direction. We'll define this as the r direction. And we have theta going around. What is this distance? We're going to define this as r. And if our material coats the walls with this thickness of w, then this, this distance right here, we can just call it r minus w, right? Let's check our requirements for if we can use a shell balance. Is there laminar flow? Well, when the system reaches steady state, this fluid is not going to be moving. So there's no flow, which means that requirement number one is met regardless. Requirement number two, are there any bends or curves in the system that we're analyzing. Well, even though the inside of the capillary tube is cylindrical and there is a curve to that, the individual cubes that we're going to be looking at for the material are all going to be similar. They're all in the same direction. Um, it's a consistent pattern. There's no unexpected curves or changes in that. And three is it's steady state. Yes, it is steady state. When we pull this tube up out of the fluid, some is going to leak out, some is going to leak out, but what we're left with on the inside is going to stay there. So I just redrew the profile so we can work on this page. For the sake of argument, I'm just going to show you that it doesn't matter whether we define the velocity of this fluid to be going up or going down. For this, ex for this uh, example, we're just going to say that the velocity of the fluid inside is going to be up. So we have the z working over here, and we also have likewise a vz coming up from the bottom. Okay? We're going to define this coordinate as z and some z plus delta z over here. Okay, now where are our shear forces acting? We have contact with the wall right here, okay? If our vz is going up, then this wall is going to want to hold on to that fluid. It's going to be keeping it, resisting the, the motion of the fluid to go up, okay? So we can say that there is a tau working in this direction down on the inside of the wall. Now, we need to find the subscripts for this. In order to do this, it's most helpful to look at a little component. Now, in the previous problem, we used Cartesian coordinates, but in this problem, it's cylindrical, so we're going to have to revert to cylindrical coordinates. Let's draw this out. All right, so this side right here is going to be at an r plus delta r. This side over here is going to be at an r. That means that somewhere over here is the axis of the tube, the capillary. And this is just a little cutout, OK? And this angle that we're looking at this is, this is our theta, therefore no, 
therefore this arc length is going to be defined as the radius at that point, so r plus delta r times delta theta, and the radius, the arc length at this point, excuse me, is going to be some r times delta theta. Okay, and this height here is merely a delta z. Perfect. So let's look back at this shear force. According to this, shear force is acting down. What plane is it acting in? It's acting in, it's acting in the R plane. Do you see that? So it's going to be tau R. And what direction is it acting in? It's acting in Z. So it's going to be tau R Z. Likewise, we have another tau RZ over here. Okay, so we define velocity, we define tau. Um, do we have any pressure gradients on this system? No, we don't. It's an atmospheric pressure. Um, the pressure around this block is going to be equal, therefore we don't have to include pressure. So let's go ahead and do our shell balance. So we have a velocity times a, times a density. This gives us momentum in per time times the area gives us force. And we also have to account for this fluid flow in and out, which is going to give us a momentum flow rate. So in order to get that, we do density times velocity again. To make it a flow rate, we multiply by velocity once more. And this is acting on this velocity in is acting right there. And we also have another velocity acting over there. So velocity into the system will be defined as positive. It's acting at z. We have velocity. We have velocity going out of the system, so we have momentum going out of the system, and it's acting at z plus delta z, right up here. Okay, okay. so there's two things we have left to add to this equation. We have shear force, and we have the gravitational, um, the weight of this, of this, uh, this block. Okay. So in order to figure out the sign for the shear force, let's think about the system. So we have this plasticky material in here, and naturally gravity is going to want to pull it down. Okay. So as you go inside towards the center of the capillary, there's going to be some force pulling down. And what's keeping the material to the wall? is some force going up. Now these mystical forces that I'm talking about are just the shear forces, okay? So even though in this diagram I drew the wall force, the shear force is going down and the in inner shear force is going up, it helps to think about it um, the other way around. So for shear force we have Let's do the shear force at the wall, so R plus delta R. And then since this force is pulling it up, which is in the positive Z direction, it's going to be positive, and the shear force at the wall at this near the center, so our tau RZ at R is going to be negative because it's pulling it down. Now we have to remember that all our terms have to be forces so in order to make this a force we have to multiply by the area. So tau rz at r plus delta r is acting on this surface which has an area of r plus delta r delta theta times delta z. 
So let's write that in. That's very cryptic, Chris. Okay, times delta z times delta theta. And the inner shear force is acting on a face that has an area of r delta theta delta z. Okay, so this accounts for the shear forces. The only thing we have left is the gravitational pull on this guy. So gravity. And since gravity is going down, we're going to define it as negative. Gravity is merely the density of the fluid times the gravitational pull times the volume, so delta x, no, no, sorry, delta theta, delta z, delta r, r, that was kind of confusing, sorry, I'll just stick the r up here in front. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing we did in the previous problem and divide both sides by the volume of this. So now that we've wrote the entire equation, we can go ahead and start canceling some terms. This is our accumulation side. Is there going to be anything accumulating inside the system? No, there's going to be no accumulation of momentum because we assume it's a steady state. So this is going to go down to zero. Alright, so we can go in to the other side. And, write this as zero. Once we divide both sides by volume, we'll be getting, go back to our calculus one days, using the definition of a derivative, all of this can reduce down to z, zero equals the negative derivative of, oi, oi, of rho, vz squared dz plus now this is where it gets um, a little bit tricky since our definition of a derivative does not include the r plus delta theta what we want to do is remove a 1 over r from this term so all we did there was just extract an R. Okay. And that enables us to apply the definition of derivative to this. Notice how we how I included an R in the derivative. And minus rho G Z. Perfect. Okay, so let's think about this. Can we cancel out this term? Is there going to be any change in momentum as we go up and down this pipe instead of this capillary? No, there will not be any change. So this too can go to zero. And when you're on the test, make sure to include that you can cancel this out because the gradient of velocity equals zero because we're dealing with an incompressible incompressible fluid when it's all said and done we have rho gz equals one over r derivative of r tau rz delta r. As in the previous problem, we can move the r over to this side, move the dr over to this side, integrate, we're left with an equation that has tau rz equal um, some constant that's a function of r, and we can plug in Newton's law of viscosity, integrate once more, and then apply our two boundary conditions. 
Okay, Let's, I'll just run through that really quickly. Shoot Newton's, Newton's law of viscosity into here, and we get this from. So we get tau R Z equals mu d V Z d R. Shoot this back into here, and we'll get, and you'll be left with V Z equals squared rho g z for two mu plus c one for mu times r plus c two. Use your boundary conditions and you can solve for c one and c two. So what are our boundary conditions? Well, let's look at the wall. So at r equals r, our velocity in the z direction is what? Zero. And secondly, at the most interfacing side of the material, so at big R minus the width of the material, do we want a velocity boundary condition or do we want a shear boundary condition? Let's look at our problem. Um, if we wanted to, we could incorporate a shear boundary condition. And we know that at the most interfacing side of the wall, the shear force in the R Z direction is zero. The reason it's zero is because the fluid is no longer moving. The gravitational pull on the material is equivalent to the shear force on the innermost side of the wall going up. I hope this has helped you a little bit in understanding the application and use of the shell balance and just remember if you want to use the shell balance make sure that there's laminar flow no bends or curves in the system you're analyzing that it's steady state that you can define at least two boundary conditions and take your time, take your time to draw out the unit volumes, whether that's a square for Cartesian coordinates or the equivalent shapes for cylindrical or spherical coordinates.